Okay. I think we're good. All right. Uh, so, title is uh, Binomial Distribution. And again, we're on Unit 3. This is the last lesson in Unit 3. Uh, so, after this, we're done, guys. Um, and then we're just have, after this, we just have three other units. So, we're kind of, that's why that's why I'm collecting your homework. It's almost, that's the best way to think of this. is almost like your midterm, right? Because, uh, of course, the course is, roughly speaking, it's kind of divided into probability in the first half and then statistics in the second half. Um, so we finished, we're about halfway through the course, right? So that's a good feeling. So we're, we're almost done, and that's why I want to just collect your homework. Um, I think by maybe the end of the week, this is my goal. I don't know if I'll do it, but by the end of the week or definitely by next Monday, I'll maybe give you, like, what your mark is so far, and it's just a good idea for you to see, like, where you're kind of standing, okay? Um, so... Uh, what you're going to learn today, and again, don't worry about writing to learn new objectives. It's more for you don't have to write it down. Um, so we're going to talk about what a Bernoulli uh, trial is. And then we're going to identify when and how we use binomial probability. Um, so I'll talk about what this is. And the last thing we're going to talk about is how to find the expected value of a binomial experiment. Uh, that last part is actually pretty good. It goes by pretty fast. Uh, so just a quick little recap. Um, I know we talked about this with Mr. Edwards on a Friday, or I don't think that was the lesson you were going over, right? Uh, expected value and what we expect to occur in an, an experiment, right? So expected value is is pretty much exactly what you expect it to be. The name says it itself is what we think, what we expect to be uh, the result after several, several times. So when you are rolling two dice and you're trying to find the sum, we know that on average, we should probably expect our result to be at seven or very close to seven, right? Uh, and we can actually see it here that seven is the most likely, um, but it's not the most likely in the sense that it's the majority, right? It's still not the majority. It's only six out of it's, it's only a six out of thirty six chance that it occurs. So even though it's the most likely, it doesn't mean that it's winning by a landslide, right? Um, it is very likely for it to be very close to seven, though. Absolutely, right? We can see here that if you combine six, seven, and eight, that's now we're kind of talking, right? Maybe you have a better chance of picking one of those numbers. Uh, but what we kind of see here in general with probability expected values that we tend to go towards one pattern. There's always a number that we're kind of going towards, but it doesn't mean that we are always going to get that number, right? It just, and again, if that was the case, then why would you even, why would they have any sort of games, right, where we have two dice? if we were always going to get seven or if we were going to get seven the majority of the time. That's not actually what happens, right? Um, so we talked about expected value, uh, which is basically we think will occur. And then we also talked about how these the probability of the different outcomes can actually be listed off on a graph. And this graph is what we call a probability distribution. It's just a way of visually showing what the different probability outcomes. And again, Mr. Edwards talked about this, how you can either put this on a table or you can put it on a graph. It's two different ways that you can represent this. The nice thing about the table, what, what would you say is nicer about the table compared to the, a chart or, or a graph? Sorry, what's nicer about the graph compared to like doing just on a chart or a table? Why, why might this be preferable? Doing on a graph like that. Yep. Visually see. Is, quantities. Exactly, right? You can visually see the quantities here, and it's very easy to compare, right? When you look at this, I feel like, and, and I think it's just the way our minds work, numbers, yeah, like you you have a sense, like if I was to tell you, like, you know, 6 over 36 compared to 2 over 36, obviously, you know, 6 over 36 is bigger, but when you see it visually, it just kind of helps to be like, well, it's actually quite a lot bigger, it's three times bigger, right? Um, it's just a different way to represent your data, right? And I, I personally like the way the probability distribution graphs are shown. It just really gives you a good indication as, as to where our data seems to be trending towards, right? Um, and again, uh, we know that there is actually a formula we can use to find the expected value. Don't worry about writing this one down because we actually talked about this example already. I think you did it with Mr. Edwards. Uh, finding the expected value of, of a random variable, let's say they want to find uh, what the expected value is for a single roll. If you're rolling a six-sided die, you know all you need to do in this case is simply take each of the results and you multiply by their probabilities. And then once you do that, then you add them up, and this ends up giving you the expected value of 3.5. And I think I ran out of space to actually write the answer there. 
Oh, I actually did write it at the bottom there, just so you can't really see it. So the expected value there should be 3.5. Um, so this is the one that you guys were, I think you guys were asking about this, the formula. The formula looks really intimidating for expected value. But essentially for expected value, all we're doing is we're taking each of the actual results and multiplying by their by their probability of occurring. And then once you do, once you multiply by their probability, you then add them all up, and that gives you your expected value, which is 3.5. So if the expected value of rolling a die is 3.5, that means that on average, generally speaking, we should expect a result between three and four. But if you actually look at the expected value for, um, if you look at the probability distribution of a die, a one single die with six sides, it's pretty even, right? It's not like one is more likely than the other. But if you look at the sum of two dice, it does actually show a bit more of a pattern, right? You actually can see here that you're much more likely to get the results that are in between or very close to seven than you are to get uh, a snake eye or a double six, right? Hopefully that kind of makes sense. So again, none of this, uh, you don't have to write it down. I'm just kind of recapping all the ideas from before. And the reason I'm doing this is because what we're talking about today has a lot of connection with this, right? Um, but we're specifically gonna be looking at um, experiments where we're only focused on really two outcomes. Instead of looking at many different outcomes, we almost subcategorize our outcomes into success and failure, right? So I'm gonna go to the next part, if you don't mind. So don't worry about writing this down. Um, so this is exactly what we're gonna focus on today. A lot of times we don't actually care about all the different outcomes. We really just wanna know, does something happen or does something not happen? Right? Is it a pass or a fail? Lots of examples on this, right? Uh, you're, throwing, you're throwing a basketball, right? Like you're having a free throw competition. You just want to know, do you get it in or not, right? Uh, if you're testing out products, does it work or not? Um, on the test, did you get it right or not, right? Did, was the question correct or not? That's really all you're concerned with, right? So if we are only, if we're looking at experiments that are only concerned with two outcomes, pass or fail, success or failure, uh, we actually can use something called binomial distribution. That's what we're going to look at today. So first thing, Bernoulli triangle. So this is where you start writing. We have the first keyword here. So a Bernoulli trial uh, or trials are repeated independent trials. So a couple keywords here. Repeated meaning that they're one after another, right? Uh, independent meaning that they don't affect each other at all, right? Um, and independent trials that have two possible outcomes. There are only two possibilities here, success or failure. And a good question people always ask, how do you know something is successful? Which one is a success? Which one is a failure? Uh, most of the time on the question, it'll be pretty obvious, right? Like if you're doing the, the example about the basketball shooting, um, Obviously, if you are in a free throw, the success is obviously getting it in, right? I think everyone can agree on that. Or a test that you get it correct versus not correct. Uh, but sometimes if you're doing like heads or tails, um, it just depends on whatever it is that you're aiming for, right? Generally speaking, like when you're doing heads or tails, you might say like, you know, I'm heads, I win, heads, tails, you lose, right? Sorry, heads, I win, tails, you win, right? Uh, so that would be an example of something where you just kind of assign uh, the value of which one is going to be success, which is going to be failure. By the way, this is really, really random, but um, I always talk about this. I don't know if uh, you ever heard of this, but um, I, I swear to you, I actually heard this from like way back, I think when I was in high school, and it honestly has never failed me. So they always say like, if you're making a tough decision, um, and again, you don't have to listen to me, don't quote me on this. They say, Flip a coin and and assign your assign to yourself and say, all right, it's, if it's heads, I'm gonna do it. If it's tails, I'm not gonna do it. And sometimes you don't know if you want something or not. You're like, I don't know if I should do it or not. But if you flip your coin and you get the result, if you get heads, and then you're like, oh, I should do it. Look at your reaction, right? If you're kind of happy about it, then it's probably what you want. But if you're if you're kind of like, because there's a gut instinct, right? And if you're looking at it, you get tails. You're like, ah, that's, I want to flip it again, or maybe it didn't work then you probably don't want it, right? Um, it sounds really weird, but I've, I've literally have made decisions <laughs> about like jobs sometimes, because like, sometimes you don't know, right? You don't know what you want. And sometimes you just need a gut feeling. I, I swear to you, it works, right? 
uh, because it's just a, it's, it's something in your instinct. You either are happy with the result or you're not happy, right? And that's one of those like 50-50, right? You can just be like, heads or tails. And then if you don't get the result you want, then you're like, then you know right away, you're like, oh, maybe I don't want that. Or you maybe you're I want to make every decision with that, just so you know. But uh, just a little thing. I, I kind of learned that when I was younger, and I was like, oh, that's actually it's been pretty true a couple times. So probability of success in a Bernoulli trial, uh, we actually denote it as P. Uh, that's just the notation that we use for this. We just say probability, we just use P. If it's success, and if it's a failure, we use 1 minus P. Anyone want to guess what's 1 minus P? Instead of like F. What do I use 1 minus P as a probability of failure? Anyone remember compliments? Yeah, right? This is that, it's just the opposite, right? So if, if the success is, if I have a 40% chance of success, that means by default, whatever's left over is my failure, right? So that would be 1 minus the probability of success. Good morning, Chris Anderson. Sorry for this interruption. Uh, Joe Maloney and Mara Bell has sent out the uh, link to for our welcome back virtual mass. Uh, if you see the link, it would be a great opportunity to uh, have your students uh, watch it. Um, it was professionally done. Very pleased and very, very proud of everyone that uh, had a hand in making that uh, our first virtual uh, liturgy of the welcome back here. So if you have time, we'd encourage you to watch that with your staff, your students. Thank you, and have a great morning. So uh, <clears throat> the other key thing in a Bernoulli trial, so obviously in a Bernoulli trial, you have either success or failure. Um, your probability of success is P. Your probability of failure is just the difference, 1 minus P. Um, there's another really important thing that we always have to assume with these. Uh, we always assume that the probability of the outcomes has to be the same throughout. So they will never actually change. And that and the reason for that is because they're independent, right? So as an example, if going back to the hot hand fallacy, right? Um, so we that's an example of something where it actually changes that people become more confident. So if you get more and more shots and people are like, oh, I think that their chance of getting it in is going to be even higher or maybe lower, right? Uh, with Bernoulli trials, we just assume that the probability is the same throughout, right? Um, and a lot of these questions, not to say that they're not they're not good or not realistic, but sometimes they're not they're not always the most realistic. Because, uh, for example, if you look at athletes, you say like you know they have a batting average of zero point two five, right? That means a quarter of the time they're gonna they're gonna hit it. Does it always happen? No, right, and that's and that's just based on the numbers that we've observed. So it really does range a lot, right? So we have to just be careful and say, and we always are mindful that in real life it's not always going to be perfect. But whenever we're doing these questions, we're doing really trials. We always assume the probabilities are the same. You have to assume they're the same. If not, it's it's a totally separate set of problems, right? Everyone okay with that so far? So let me know if you need a little more time. So again, key thing, Bernoulli trials are success or failure, only two options. And then we always assume they're independent of each other, right? So if you had, so going back to that basketball example, if you're shooting uh, basketballs in, right, and you're trying to get as many as you can in, um, you're going to assume that if you miss, if you miss a basket, that's not going to change your odds, right? You're not going to, hopefully, according to the in Bernoulli trials, we assume is basket. That's not going to change your odds, right? You're not going to, hopefully, according to the in Bernoulli trials, we assume it's not going to make you nervous and be like, oh, shoot, I didn't get it in. And all of a sudden, your confidence goes down. Or maybe the opposite. Maybe you don't get it in and you're like, I really need to get it in, right? So then you might really ramp it up and really try your best to get it in. Right. Uh, so in Bernoulli trials, we just assume that your probability of success is the same throughout. So now we get into binomial experiments. So how does this connect? So binomial experiment is basically a group of n identical Bernoulli trials. 
By the way, I like the setting, the background for this. The color is nice, but just thinking for writing, it's probably not the best. I don't know if you can see it well. Uh, let me know. I can use a different color next time. So a binomial experiment basically consists of n identical Bernoulli troughs. And what do I mean by n? So a lot of things in math, we don't know how many, how many troughs we have. You have to give us some sort of letter. You say it's n number of troughs. So we assume that there are n independent Bernoulli troughs. And our goal in our binomial experiment is to figure out how many successful ones we have. So how many successful um, outcomes are you going to have in those out of all those trials? So that's really your goal in the binomial experiment. And then the number of successes that you have, that's going to be your binomial random variable. And there's a lot of new words this time. I feel like that's the only hard thing with this lesson. There's a lot of new terminology, but the examples are actually not that bad. It's pretty good. Cool. So the number of successful trials that you have, that's gonna be um, your, the number of successful trials is gonna be your binomial random variable. And again, random variable, we talked about this already. Uh, it's basically a variable that represents that, that you're, that varies depending on what you're actually, depending on the experiment, right? So in this case, our variable is actually the number of successes that we have. And the probability distribution, so the actual distribution graph that you have that's attached to this binomial experiment is called uh, a binomial distribution. So that's pretty easy. So the probability distribution of the binomial random variable is called a, prob is called a binomial distribution. Right, yes. I'm just going to give an example here. Hopefully, I feel like we're looking at an example with a more concrete example, we can go through what each of them mean. Um, so let's look at this first one. And it's a lot of writing, uh, but I'll just tell you what coin a hundred times. Right? The coin, tossing the coin a uh, hundred times. This would be an example of a binomial, um, of a binomial experiment. And does anyone want to guess why? Why would this be binomial experiment? Yeah, either heads or tails, and are each of the rolls, each of the tosses, are they independent? Yes, yeah, <laughs> sorry, I said it as if like, I wasn't sure. They are independent, right? Because if I toss if I toss a coin and I say heads or tails, and then I toss it again, it's not like my coin remembers, there's no memory, right? It's not like your coin is remembering your result, and it's like, oh, you got heads, so now I'm gonna give you tails, or you got tails, now you have heads. There's no memory in the coin, right? So the coin obviously is independent, right? So in this case, my coin flips are all independent. And is that like Jessica said? I have a 50-50 chance of getting heads or tails, right? And that never changes. It, should, it shouldn't change theoretically, right? At all. Um, so because of that, we can actually express this as a binomial distribution when we look at the probability of the two. So 
What I want to show you here is this graph that would actually match up with this distribution. So if we were to toss it a hundred times, and, and again, don't even worry about drawing the graph here. Like I do not want to do a draw the graph. Anyway. Just I just want to look at the graph and we'll kind of interpret it together. So if I were to uh, let's say that I asked Matt to toss a coin a hundred times, we it, most of us without even taking this course, uh, anyone I'm pretty sure can tell you that we probably expect that out of a hundred times there should be heads about fifty times, about fifty times, right? Um, and if you got something, now, are we going to get 50 exactly? Like if I toss a coin 100 times, should I get 50 heads, 50 tails exactly? Or what do you think? Probably not, right? It would, it, like, it's it's really rare if it's going to be like 50, 50, right? Like exactly the dot. It'd be cool, but it's not extremely likely. And actually, you can even look right here. This table actually tells you how likely it is. There's only a 7.8, sorry, almost 8% chance that you'll have exactly 50 heads, 50 tails. So you're not actually, you're not very likely to get that. But if Matt told me, for example, hey, I actually ended up getting uh, heads 20 times. Well, according to this table here, like slim to none, right? Um, and maybe not impossible, but like I'm talking so small that it doesn't even show up on that graph, right? That's how tiny it is, right? So his math's chance of getting um, a heads 20 times out of a total times of 100, that's weird, right? Like, I, and I, again, just think about what makes realistic sense. If somebody was doing this in real life, they were tossing a coin 100 times and they're like, oh, I only got heads like, you know, 10 times. Something's weird because sh you, you shouldn't have a 10% chance, right? Uh, it should be much higher than that. And again, we talked about this, that experimental theoretical probability, they are different and they're not always going to be the same, but they should eventually start getting closer and closer to each other. And because I've done this a hundred times, they really should be a lot closer to each other. Does that kind of make sense? So probability distribution, when we're looking at this, is we're looking at what is, what, and we're basically looking at the chances of having uh, heads X number of times. We don't know exactly how many times. But what we're doing is we're saying, like, what happens, what's the chance that I have heads 40 times, 44 times, 52 times, right? And what we're doing is, in this distribution, we're actually figuring out exactly what the probability would be as we go along. And again, why are these numbers at the edges really small, like, or so small that you don't even see them? What is this thing over here? So why are these probabilities so small here? Or like not not well, not only small, they seem like they don't even exist. I guess. So if I'm flipping it a hundred times, basically what we're saying is that you would get heads seventy-two times, right? Again, extremely, extremely, extremely unlikely, right? 72, that means that you're 70, you have a 70% chance of getting heads. That seems very that seems very far from what it should be, which is 50%, right? So the chance of it happening, it can happen. We're not saying it doesn't happen, but we're just saying that it, if you look at this, this distribution table, it's extremely, extremely unlikely, right? Not impossible, because technically it's pretty unlikely, right? That that's gonna happen. Does this make sense so far, guys? Okay, so uh, I wanted to show you a couple more distribution tables just so you guys can kind of compare. So let's look at this next one together. So you're tossing, uh, so if you don't mind writing this one down, we'll do this one together. So you're tossing going 30 times. We should get a three about a six of the time, right? Do you guys kind of agree on that? Because there's six sides. So the chance of me getting a three, which is only one of the sides, is about one sixth of the time, right? About. So that means that one sixth of 30 is five. So we should get a three about five times. Now, if, if I don't get a three five times, does that mean that the person that gave me that die, they fixed it? Or something they messed with it? Yeah. What that really means is that you know, it's just chance, right? I could get a three. I could get a three 
five times, but I also could get a three zero times. I could also get three ten times. It's possible that I may not get it exactly the same number of times I'm supposed to get. What the distribution does is it actually illustrates to me what is the chance, what is the probability, me, the probability of me getting um, some number, x number of of threes, if I were to roll it thirty times. And then what we're doing is we're looking at probability of each of those times. So if we were to do a distribution of what would the highest peak? Okay. Yeah. Jessica? Yeah. I was going to say 3.5. Why 3.5? Oh, yes, because of a single die. Yes, that, that's like your expected value. Yes, that is. You're, you're kind of on the right track, but remember, this is an expected value. We're actually looking at the number of times I should get a three, the number of times I would expect to get a three if, if I were to roll it 30 times. Like, I, I know exactly what you said, 3.5, but yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I hope. Yeah, I should get it about five times, right? That's what I said. So when we look at the distribution table, I should get a big bulk of my numbers, right? Like the, the probability... Uh, near the five should be quite high, right? So let's see what actually happens here. There's my first graph. Okay, so let's look at my first graph here. So exactly like Hope said, same she is. We can actually see here that five has the biggest probability, but it doesn't mean that it's going to be five all the time. You can actually see here that it four is actually pretty common as well. So it's three. So it's six, right? Good morning. Please excuse the interruption. We are now ready for all grade nine teachers to walk their students to the Kennedy Field. Please ensure social distancing as you walk down and all students wear your CCH spirit mask. Thank you. Uh, if you're looking at this distribution table, Exactly like Hope was saying, right? Even before even before you took this course, most of you, if I told you that question, like I said, hey, you roll a die 30 times, how many times should I get one of the faces, which is three? About five times, right? And why is it five? See here that five is the most likely to occur. But it doesn't mean that five is the only one to occur. Uh, four is also pretty likely, so is three, so is six. But we can definitely see here that numbers like 11, and especially once we go down to 12, 13, 14, 15, they're less and less likely. Why are these ones less and less likely to occur? So out of 30 rolls, I would get a three, oh, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 times. Why is that way less likely? Don't worry guys, you don't have to give me like a crazy answer. Just, just intuitively, out of 30 times, why is that much less likely? Yeah. Because that would be like almost 50% of the time. Yeah, exactly. Once you get to this area, you're almost saying that you get th a three. You would only get this side, three, 50% of the time. So if something like that happened, then something's weird, right? Like something's fishy. So something should go off in your head and be like, ah, I think something's wrong with that die, right? So this is actually how people use, so like kind of making the connection. And again, we I know we haven't talked about this yet. But when they do testing on uh, patients, we're going to talk about that, like how it's, how you carry out experiments. When they do testing on drugs or on patients and they want to test out if a drug is effective or not, that's really what they look at what is normal in a population. And they say, what's normal based just on probability? So what is normal based on probability? Yeah, I could get a, I could hypothetically get a three, nine times. I could hypothetically get a three, 10 times. Could I get an 11? Could I get it 11 times? Yeah, but very unlikely. Can I get it 12 times? Yeah, but very unlikely. Uh, and then once you get past in these smaller regions, you know that something's really fishy. So if you're testing out a drug or you're testing out any sort of experiment, if you notice that you're kind of in this realm that's more what, according to math, should be almost impossible, then something is maybe a little bit off, right? Which means that something isn't working well, um, the experiment might be rigged, whatever it may be, right? Um, so this is when we start kind of making those connections between not just the, not just what you actually get on the experiment, but what's going to happen. You want to be able to compare the two, 
right? So we can see here that, yes, even though five is actually the expected number, it doesn't mean you're always gonna get five, right? Um, it's very possible that you're gonna be a little bit off of it, but you shouldn't be that off, right? That's basically what we're saying. Uh, the next one over here, if you have a multiple choice test and there's 10 questions there, right? So on the test, uh, on the multiple choice test, 10 questions, the chance that you get, and let's say that you have four options, um, we know that realistically, we should be getting about a quarter of the questions correct, right? If you're just totally guessing. And that kind of makes sense that two would be the most common occurrence. You should probably get about two questions right. That's the most common. But it's also very possible that you could, you could normal you could still get four questions but the chance of you getting four all even eight even 80 percent of them right is actually pretty low right you can see here that's quite low and the 10 you don't even see the probability because of how low it is so that means that the chance of you getting all four of them correct so all 10 questions correct just by guessing it's possible but it, it's extremely extremely unlikely right uh, and that's why you don't even see it on the table because of how small it is. Does that make sense, guys? So everyone follow along with what, what I mean by probability distributions. And you, So hopefully that makes more sense. I know we talked about this already, but I feel like on the first day, it probably did feel like a lot. And I think now that you're starting to see more examples, hopefully it's a bit more clear what I mean by that, right? Um, so now we're really focused not just at looking where before we were kind of focused on like one event would be like, what's the probability, you know, you get two heads and one tail. It was a very specific event we were interested in, but, okay. but now we're actually looking overall at the whole entire experiment, right? What is the most, what are, what, what outcomes are likely and or unlikely, right? We're looking at as, as a whole big spectrum. So now we're just really interested in the total number of outcomes that we get, total number of successes that we get. Right? And we're looking at how likely we see have um, X number of outcomes. Okay, so I'm going to go to the next part here. So let's look at an example. So this you're definitely have to write down. So there's a 70% chance that you have an, that an algae drug will be effective. And we let's say that we test this out on 10 random people. So we take 10 people to be part of our sample. By the way, not a good sample. We will talk about sample sizes and all that later on. Uh, not a great sample at all because you only have 10 people. That's extremely small. You, When you're testing drugs out or anything that's you know quite significant, you definitely want to make sure you have more than just 10 people, right? Um, but let's say you test this out on 10 people. You want to figure out, uh, sorry, what is the probability that it will be effective on seven people? So the drug is effective 70% of the chance, sorry, 70% of the time. And you want to figure out what's the probability that I test this out and it actually works on seven out of the 10 people. Anyone want to take a guess what the answer might be? So it's effective 70% of the time. So what's the chance that it's effective on seven out of 10 people? So I'm not sure if anyone's thinking this, but maybe you don't want to say it because you're shy. But seven out of 10, isn't that the exact same thing as 70%? So a common thing that people say when they look at a question like this and they're like, wouldn't that be 100% of the time? Because 70%? It works 70% of the time, so what's the probability it works seven out of 10 times? It almost, I think it's your intuition, and maybe some of you are thinking that, but you don't want to say it out loud. Your intuition might tell you, wouldn't that be all the time, right? Because it's affected 70% of the time. But again, key word, it's affected 70% of the time. So you got to think about that carefully, right? Um, so it's not, it, this, the answer you'll see is actually not what you expect, right? You might expect it to be higher than this, um, it's not. So what we're going to do in this question is actually look at how to find the probability of this, and then we're hope hoping to get a sort of shortcut that we can use. So the first step, um, 
you know it's effective 70% of the time, which basically means that you have a 70% chance of success. So this is gonna be your success right here. And that means that 30% is your failure, right? So 70, you have a 70% success, uh, success rate and 30% success rate. And because they are independent, how do I figure out the probability of these 10 different events happening back to back? So there's 10 experiments. So it might seem like a lot of work, but because there's 10 of them and they're all independent, how do I find the probability of all 10 happening? What can I do with probabilities if they're independent? I want to find the probability of all of them. I can. Got it. Thank you. Multiply together, right? All we're going to do is multiply. And again, why do we do that? Because they're independent. If they were not independent, then that's a kind of a different story, right? We'd have to do the conditional probabilities. Uh, but in this case, because all, all 10 of them are independent, we're essentially just going to take the probability of seven successes and we're going to do success, 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 probability, success, probability, success, probability, success. We're going to do that seven times. Times of probability of failure, times of probability of failure, times of probability of failure. So we're going to have 10 different probabilities multiplied together. That's really cool, right? Sorry, guys, I don't know. I, I, I honestly don't know why it's freezing in here, but it really is cool. But I'm not going to lie, I never feel cold, so I don't know. Like, I, I'm just trying to sympathize with you. Yeah, there are definitely schools like that. And then other rooms are just like, boring. especially in the summer. Um, so, in this next, it's, so what we do next is we realize, well, probability of success is 0 0.7, 0 0.7, 0 0.7, 0 0.7, 0 0.7, 0 0.7, 0 0.7. Then we have the three failures, which are 0 0.0, 0 0.3, 0 0.3, 0 0.3. Now, some of you actually might already be thinking this. Isn't there an easier way of writing that? I was just kind of hoping one of you would tell me that. So I'll be writing all those numbers. Yeah. Six, seven, seven. Exactly. So hopefully, hopefully some of you noticed this. You're probably like, oh, you're crazy for doing that. Just write it like this. And you really should do that, right? Um, I just did it here just to show you. I want to show you step by step what I mean by that. I just didn't want to throw anyone off by putting exponents. Because then you're like, where do those bonus come from, right? I just want you to know all I'm doing is I'm multiplying the 10 different probabilities together, right? But of course, it's like, like Jessica said, a more effective way of doing that is just write 0 0.7 to the power of 7, 0 0.3 to the power of 3. Okay, so am I done? Is that all I have to do to find the probability? So what's the problem with me just leaving the answer there? Because it's tempting to just think, well, am I not done? I I already did. I multiplied all the probabilities. Yeah. Yes. Perfect. Here's a big caveat. You have to consider the different orders that it could be rearranged, right? So this, the way that I I have it up here, and don't worry about writing my talking points to you, so you don't have to write the talking points. Um, but the key thing here, exactly like Hope said, is that the seven successes and the three failures that I have here can be rearranged. That word is very key, right? So we have seven successes, three failures. Those seven successes and three failures can be rearranged. And we have to consider that as well. Because right now, what this, the what I have written down exactly as I have it here. What that really means is that I have seven successes and then three failures, followed by three failures. But the question, did the question say, what's the probability that you have seven successful ones and then three failures at the end? No, it just said seven successes, three failures in any order, right? So we have one of those other questions. We go back to combinations. We have another question where we have to think, how many ways can I rearrange that? So how do I find out how I can rearrange it? Well, let's think about it this way. It's probably easier if I just think about it like this. Um, 
I'm actually gonna write it out like this. Success, 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 failure, 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 right? So this kind of is like those questions with how many ways can I create words? Exact same question, right? If I have 10 different objects, right? Seven of them are the same, three of them are the same. I can simply take 10 factorial divided by seven factorial is as 10 to 7, right? And why is that the same? Because we already know with competitions that when you put this in the formula, you get the exact same answer. And this is also the same as 10 choose 3 as well, if you want to do that. Are we following so far, guys? Again, I think I mentioned this already. A lot of these things are talking points, so you don't have to write it all down. The most important thing is this equation, right? Do you understand where that's coming from? And this right here, this is the big thing. Exactly what Hope said. I hope you guys kind of realize that, is that we couldn't we couldn't just write 0 0.7 to the power of 7, 7 times 0 0.3 to the power of 3. I have to also consider that I can rearrange this in different ways, right? So I'm not just going to have 7 successes and 3 failures. I could also have, I could have 6 successes a failure, a success, two failures, right? And then I could also have three failures, seven successes, or I could have uh, two successes, or I could have five successes, a failure, success, a failure, success, a failure, right? Like there's so many different ways that I could do that. But again, do you want to be doing that all day, counting that yourself? No, you're going to stress yourself out. I wouldn't even do it, right? I would have no idea where to start. Like that would take you much longer than you think, actually. So there's a shortcut to this. The shortcut is to use combinations that we learned about. So now, all we have to do is take our old formula, which is back up here. And again, going back to what Jessica said, don't even write 0 0.7 times 0 0.7 times 0 0.7, blah, blah, blah. Write 0 0.7 to the power of 7, 0 0.3 to the power of 3. And the only difference is I'm going to multiply by 10 to 7. And then I end up with this big giant formula here, uh, or this big giant expression here, 0 0.7 to the power of 7 to 0 0.3 to the power of 3, and 10 to 7. And 10 to 7, hopefully, if you don't have a calculator, if you don't have a combination button, you're going to have to do it the old-fashioned way. 10 factorial divided by 7 factorial divided by 3 factorial. Let's get to what the answer is. Did everyone get 120? Yeah. So you would be there all day. I know some of you, when I started, remember how I started mentioning the, the ways that I could rearrange it? I think some of you, I was looking at you and at, while I was doing that. Um, and I think you even knew it would take you forever. It would take you, a hundred, it's 128, 20 ways that I can do that. So, guys, combinations are your best friends. I know that they're a pain to like, learn, and they're a little hard to understand, but that's that's really why we learned about permutation combinations, is to speed up our work, right? So that we don't have to be counting. Together, when you take 0 0.7 to the power of 7, 0 0.3 to 20, you should uh, just double check that it's correct. The answer should be 0 0.27 grounded. So that means there's a 27% chance that this will work on 70% of the patients. So it's actually not what we might have thought, right? We might have initially thought, well, wouldn't it be 100%? Because 70% of the time, it works 70% of the time, and it works on 70% of the patients. But again, that's a very specific number, right? That's just like saying, uh, remember with rolling the dice, we expect that seven is the most likely, but it's not going to happen all the time. It's just the most likely, but it's not a guarantee. Is this being sense of purpose? Okay, so anyone can anyone think of a formula that we can come up with this? So this is what we do in math. This is what mathematicians do, right? Like they look at examples, they look at a couple different scenarios, and then they try to see, is there a general way I can express this? So what is the general formula? The general formula says something. 
So I'll click and then grab this here. Uh, swear, you said it doesn't matter. In fact, I guess it doesn't work. Okay, there we go. So the general formula here, guys, uh, if we have a binomial experiment that has n Bernoulli trials, so again, what do I mean by n Bernoulli trials? That means that there are 17 different times that I'm going to do this experiment. And I want to find out what the probability, uh, sorry, and, and, and I, sorry, that my probability of success is P, and I want to find the probability that I have K successes. All I need to do is use this formula. And again, formulas, and I ho I'm hoping you become less scared of them, they always look weird. Like, I feel like formulas always just look odd the way you, the first time you look at them. When you look at an example, they make perfect sense, right? It's just that they initially look a little odd. So this formula is basically saying that you're taking the total number of trials, right? So let's say in the last example, I had 10 trials, and you're going to be choosing, you're going to be figuring out how many groups of K I can make, and K is the number of successful trials that you want. And what I'm going to do is I'm simply taking the number of successful trials, and I'm raising the probability of success to that exponent. That makes sense, right? Because if I have k number of successes, I'm going to multiply the probability of success that many times. And I take the, the probability of failure, and I raise it to your exponent, right? So if, for example, in the last example, I knew that there were seven successes. So if there's seven successes, that means that the leftover, the three, must be failures. So I would take the probability of failure and raise it to that exponent. So make sure you know what each of the variables are. The big X, by the way, people always get confused by that. Big X, what do I mean by that? That just is your variable, right? Your free variable that can, that can vary. So the X in this case, we're saying the number of successes that you have. And the number of successes is gonna change all the time, right? In the last example, the number of successes was seven, but I could have I could have asked a different question. I could have said, what's the probability that the drug works on five patients. So if it worked on, if I wanted the probability that it works on five patients, in that case, my X would be five. So I would make X equal to five. That means that I'm looking at five successes. Okay. So once you know what the formula is and how to use it, um, I would honestly I would say binomial distribution is relatively easy. Of, of the, I feel like of the three things we've learned this unit, I would say it's the easier one once you know how to use the formula. It's just a matter of identifying what the n is, that's the number of trials, identifying what the k is, the number of successes, your probability of success, and your probability of failure. That's all you really need to know, and then you can sub it into your formula. But I hope you understand where the formula came from, right? That's why I did that last example. The reason we have to use combinations is to do this. Combinations are back again because we have to consider that once we have the number of successes and the number of failures, those successes and failures can still rotate around, um, among each other, right? So just keep in mind, that, and I could do this as to trick you, although I, I won't just let you know, but if I didn't want to, if we had a little more time, I would probably throw in a question where I would say, you know, what's the probability I have, you know, six successes followed by four failures, exactly. So in that case, would I have to do the combination thing? No, I don't have to, right? Because that's a very specific outcome that I'm interested in, right? So I only have to use this combination if I don't know how I can rearrange them, right? So that's, that, and that's going to be in most of these cases, right? I'm not going to, like I said, I'm not going to try to trick you, but 
I could, I could if I want to, right? But throw a question in there, you know, kind of throw you off the right where it's where it's almost the same, except that I'm not using the combination. So let's look at an example where you're going to have to sub it into the formula. So you have a multiple choice test, and actually we just talked about this. Uh, you have eight choice, sorry, four choices. What's the probability that you score eighty percent? And actually, do you remember that I showed you the table for the multiple choice one? I think I showed you what the probability distribution was, and we actually saw that the probability of getting eighty percent was pretty small, right? Slim to none, right? And that and that should hopefully make logical sense if you're writing ten. If you're writing 10 questions, you have four choices, you should get about two and a half right. So if you're lucky, maybe three. So we're saying, what's the probability to get eight questions right? So instead of just getting three or two or three right, you're actually getting eight questions right. So your chance of this is going to be pretty small, right? So you know you're doing this wrong if you get a big answer because it won't actually make sense. All right, let's just go step by step here. What are, what is my n? What's my number of trials? Yeah. Is it 10? 10, yeah, exactly, because I have 10 questions. So every single question is a trial, right? So each time I come to a question, it's an experiment, and I'm asking myself, you know, which one am I gonna pick, the other four, right? So each question is a trial. So there are 10 questions, so there are 10 trials. So my n is 10. What is my k value? So k is the number of successes. What are the number of successes that I'm interested in? Yeah, I mean, eight, right? I'm interested in having eight successes. Perfect. What is my probability of success? Yes. One over four. One over four. Perfect. So be careful, and, and I'm glad you got the, that's good. Whenever I ask this question, sometimes people get a little confused. They look at 80% because they're like, isn't that your success? No, it's what's your probability of success for every. So every time you come to a question, what's the chance that you will randomly pick the correct answer? So there's four options. So you're doing one out of four because only one of these is correct out of the four. So it's only one out of four. We're going to write instead of n choose. K, we're going to write 10 choose 8. So this is your N, and this is your K. And I'm hoping this other stuff here makes sense. We're essentially saying that you're going to get eight questions correct. So that means that I'm going to have a quarter chance of getting it correct, but I have to multiply it by quarter by itself eight times. This is going to be eight successes, so a quarter to the power of eight, and three quarters to the power of ten minus eight. And again, I'm hoping that ten minus eight makes sense because if eight of them are correct, then how many have to be wrong? The remainder, right? Two. So that's really what this is. This is just a 